Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 195, A Year of Tabletop Gaming 2022. I'm Sean, your host, and you're with me live, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. We record Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it would be awesome if you joined us here live on Twitch. Uh, with this episode being recorded about four days before the new year and going live two days after New Year's Day, I thought that we would do the typical thing here and serve up a look back at the past year. Most played games, best new to us games, biggest surprises, etc. After that, I've got some mixed thoughts to share on two puzzle boxes from Escape Welt. And we wrap up with our usual Bellhops Tabletop segment with Sean talking about a game he played with his sister's family and a frustrating Christmas Eve for myself, as well as a bit more. Before we get to that, though, let's hear what our fans have been saying. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interaction with you fine folk, both positive and negative. Whoa, what happened there? Sorry, something <laughs> did weird things on my side of the screen. So why, why does it say another? That's why I'm confused. That's what, I don't know. <laughs> my, my, my own notes confused me. <laughs> this, is, this is why we'll just go unscripted, just like our, our holiday special from now on. I don't know if we want to restart this, but I think I'll just going. Uh, first off, we have a passionate superhero RPG fan, which we seem to draw out of the woodwork. Central Nexus, who had this to say about our topic of super games Sean has been reading, which is now at this point a true classic of ours that just <laughs> keeps coming back up. It's so weird to look at this genre. Changed so much. I collected a lot of games back in the 80s and 90s. I played the old Marvel RPG a couple times. Heroes Unlimited several times. Champions and a few others. Our group favored Mayfair's DC Heroes game and GURP Supers. I ran several campaigns for years. I had a GURPS Victorian superheroes game I remember fondly. I agree, some get wrapped up in the rules, while some of the modern games treat it less than playing a game and more just group storytelling. Scale and scope seems to be the biggest problem in the genre. Doing a skilled normal in DC Heroes could be a problem, or trying to build Superman and GURPS would be near impossible. Several systems can't do some superpowers. Tape changing in Champions required you do multiple powers in a power pool, and even then it was difficult without limiting you to a handful of specific forms. Several people I played with always hit the concept the system couldn't support. That's definitely a problem. Having superheroes be reality show participants scares me. I can't forget the Marvel Civil War started with such a team causing a villain to blast a neighborhood, resulting in several deaths. If I remember, actually, it was a schoolyard. Yeah, I can't really disagree with any of that. Uh, though I do suspect I tend to enjoy the modern idea of group storytelling more than they do. Yeah. I don't need winners and losers. Uh, as for the reality show problem, sounds like a challenge for a good RPG. <laughs> Now, sticking with comments popping up on our older uh, episodes, here's one from our two-player Date Night Games article. Keith J. Davies writes, I love Akrotiri, which is apparently also playable at three to four players if you have two copies, and originally designed for three, four, but cut down for publication. <laughs> now, I haven't played with more than two. I have two copies, but they both have the same pairs of player colors. I need to take steps to differentiate them. One of the things I find nifty about it, the maps to the temples are relative to the player positions. If you and I okay. are facing each other across the table, my north is your south and vice versa. I like that concept. The problem is I play on a three-sided table, basically, <laughs> which always ends up being a problem with games like that. We have that problem with lanterns as well. I've heard really good things about uh, Akratori over the years, but I've never actually gotten to try it. So I think it's really cool that it was originally designed for more than two. That's interesting to learn. Well, I guess it's not cool because then the publisher went in and cut it apart. But it's it's interesting to hear that. This is on my to-try list at some point. Though with the number of games on my to-try list and my number of games in my to-play list and my number of games in the obligation list, 
might be a while until Keith and I finally hook up in person. And in that case, I don't care what game he brings. He just has to cook some barbecue for me. There we go. One more comment on an older article. Surya commented on our 16 of the best engine building games article to say, a little surprised that the author feels that Century Spice Road isn't different enough from Splendor, when Splendor is based entirely on acquisition with little to no conversion. Century allows you to be creative, focus on both the mining engine as well as the conversion engine. Having played both to a significant degree, Century is far more holistic game, even if the aspect of blocking isn't available within its system. Although I do understand that it's a personal opinion, <laughs> it is still represented as an introductory piece to new gamers, and a more empathic take would have been nicer by either making the list longer as a series or dropping a line on similar games at the end of each listed game. Well, thanks for the comment, Surya. Um, as we noted at the top, we like to share feedback, both positive or negative. Uh, first, this one threw me off, because I don't mention Century Spice Road in that article at all. It's not even in the list. Um, then I scrolled down and realized, I, like, I literally, I control f to find out where Spentry came in. And it was a reply to a comment I made in reply to someone else's comment that thought Sentry should have been included. And I explained why I didn't include it was because they seem kind of similar. The thing is, though, this is personal opinion. All of our lists are personal opinion. There is no objective list of the 16 best engine building games. These are the 16 best engine building games for me and my group. And yes, I could have made the list longer, but like how useful would that be? The 30 best engine building <laughs> games or like here's every every engine building game ever made. Like would it be more empathetic to include every single engine builder we've ever played? I don't want to talk about the ones we haven't. And then even then, I'm sure there'll be someone else that would comment that we haven't tried this game or we missed that one. I, like, I'm really happy you think Sentry stands out from Slender. That's awesome. I, not every game is for everyone. I still stand by the fact that both games feel kind of similar to me, and I don't need to spend money on a game that feels similar to another one I own when I could be playing something completely different. I'm glad you enjoyed both, though. I'm happy just keeping the one in my collection. Fair enough. Next up, a quick question we got on our Horned Rat expansion for Chaos in the Old World. Jonathan Freeman asks, how is this game for two players? That's an easy one. We don't need a full episode to talk about that. Unplayable. Chaos in the Old World is a three to four player game, which goes up from three to five with the expansion. Not playable with two with the rules as written. Now, there may be a two player variant out there. I didn't go looking for it, but out of the box, no, it can't be played three player. And honestly, it's a folk on a map area majority game, and those don't tend to work very well with just two players. You don't play risk with only two. Well, next, we have a comment from Ron Frazier on our topic of games from our childhood we would still happily play. Ron says, some games I still play from my childhood that I still enjoy, Spades, Clue, Yahtzee, he's in a board game arena game right now, Connect Four, <laughs> and Checkers. Bunch of classics there. Thanks for the comment, Ron. And I'm actually kind of shocked right uh, Yahtzee's on BGA. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, next up, uh, Dian Li Zhang commented this on our Boba Mahjong unboxing. Using set collection and rummy mechanics. Technically speaking, rummy family games are using Mahjong tech mechanics. Or, to be even more nerdishly focused, Mahjong and the rummy family of games use the mechanics of precursor games based on so-called money cards. Well, fair point there, Dian Li, though I didn't put that on the game box, the publisher did. So <laughs> I'm guessing they did that just to capture audiences familiar with the different terms, right? Rummy being more well known here in North America and Mahjong um, than Mahjong. And I've got to say, most people I've met in North America think Mahjong is a game about matching pairs of tiles on a tower of pieces built up. Um, and by putting set collection there, you catch the hobby gamer. So I think that was mainly a marketing thing, not a meant to cause any insult or be using the terms incorrectly. I just think they tried to throw all three terms in there to hit the biggest group of people. Yeah, it's kind of sad that uh, Microsoft, you know, installs Microsoft Mahjong on all their new computers and it's not Mahjong, it's tile matching. I don't know yes. where, I don't understand where that game got, I mean, I understand why it's called Mahjong, sort of, but. Well, it uses Mahjong tiles. Yeah, it's Mahjong tiles. But it's not. It should Mahjong be like Mahjong, Mahjong tile game. game, not Mahjong. 
because mahjong yeah. is a whole different thing. Well, a lot of different things, really. True. Uh, well, let's yeah, finish. Saying mahjong is kind of like saying poker. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, let's finish this off on a positive note with this comment from Bob Hill on our topic of tips and tricks for playing superhero RPGs. God damn, a true treasure trove of wisdom from both of you. Thanks, guys. Well, thanks. Treasure trove. I dig it. I like that. We're going we're gonna to have to work that in. We're the treasure trove of giving information to help you improve your game. That doesn't really work. <laughs> thanks, Bob. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback by commenting on our posts, emailing mo at tabletopbellhop.com, sending us a message, or tagging us on social media. We're normally here to answer your game gaming or game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. So due to the timing of when this particular episode is being recorded right now on December 28th, and when it drops, which is on January 3rd, I decided to put that question hat aside for the tonight and instead spend some time looking back at 2022, at least as far as it pertains to us and tabletop gaming and not current social events or <laughs> other problems we had in our lives or any of that. Just from the gaming side of things, this is a retrospective on the board games we played. Now, while we've been impacted by the world around us in various ways, it has at least gotten better. That's true. So first off, I gotta say 2022 felt like we did a lot more gaming. We played a lot more games. We tried a lot more things. We got together with people and gamed more often. Um, and it definitely was in the case of in-person gaming. There were no full-on lockdowns. We were forced to stay in our homes for multiple days, which meant more gaming with people in our bubble. Now, we did tend to stick to a bubble. So we gained more with Tori and Kat, as well as the extended family going over to Brenda's house. While we never got to the point where we felt tra comfortable traveling or attending any cons, uh, at least myself in particular, we spent way more time playing physical games at the table and less time on Board Game Arena, which is where I spent most of my gaming time last year. I finally got to swing down to Windsor a little bit more, at least until I moved here and started seeing you even less. Well, that, that's <laughs> shifting a bit the other way, finally. <laughs> we're, we're starting to hang out a little bit more. Um, part of that, I think our entire problem is like two months were a write-off this year, and that's, again, not gaming-related, but I think it impacts some of the numbers we're going to talk about today. Now, one of the awesome things that did happen, uh, especially since no one seemed to get sick off of it, is by the end of the year, I actually hosted my first public play event since 2019. I was over at a new venue for us, the Barbershop Bar on Howard, and I've got to say it was nice to be out sharing the hobby with the public again. This was not a board gamer event at a hobby game store. This was very much a public play event with gamers and non-gamers and curious people there, and that was really awesome. This is the big thing I'm looking forward to in 2023, is this becoming a more regular occurrence. And heck, I'll announce it right now for anyone who happens to be in the Windsor, Essex area. We're looking at January 21st. I'm going to confirm that date right here. Yes, January 21st as our next event at the Barbershop Bar. Indeed. While the world has not recovered and we all need to act a little differently in this new normal going forwards, we are going forwards. And that means more gaming as well as so much more. So I think the biggest thing that's happened this past year, though, as far as our show is concerned and the tabletop bellhop, our podcast and all our content is Sean moving down here to the Windsor area. While we haven't gotten together as often as we would have liked so far due to a bunch of garbage happening in November and October, it's already had an impact on the number of games we've gotten to play with the huge advantage. And I think this is the biggest change you're going to see going forward with the show of Sean now being able to actually play most, if not all, of the games we review. Though it does mean the end of Sean Con. Indeed, no more Sean Con, but... Hopefully the first of several boosts to our content that are coming, starting with my proximity, meaning I can play more of the games we review in person, as well as just play more games in general. Mm -hmm. But also with the ability to pass around components, I can add more content to the video reviews that we were never able to previously do. Right. Hopefully increasing the, their value to people even further beyond just this show, but into the YouTube realm as well. Yeah, our video on demand content should be getting better, possibly even our blog videos, depending on what we do for pictures 
and stuff like that, not blog videos, blog pictures. Uh, as well, uh, we're going to be using some of Sean's expertise to try to set up the new recording area, though I don't even really want to talk about that too much because I'm going to promise something in January and it'll be done in December. But it is something that is coming soon to our show. All right, so let's get to the games, right? The numbers, some numbers and games lists and and feedback and stats and all that fun data nerds seem to enjoy. Um, now, all of my data this year is coming from Board Game Geek. Um, there's going to be some holes because of that. Um, some of the types of games we've been reviewing, especially recently, aren't listed on Board Game Geek because they are more puzzles than board games. Though it's odd some of the stuff that is listed there. Like I'm kind of baffled by what I can and can't find. Uh, the other thing that I didn't really dive into, and uh, oh, you know what, we'll save this for later, is RPGs. But when we get to the end of what I've got listed here, I do want to talk about RPGs just a little bit. So what I want to start with is how many games did we each play? How many games did we play? Based on the Board Game Geek, it looks like about 300 games. Now, I know I forgot to log plays. Like, I know there's certain ones, and I'm usually pretty good, but I always forget a few. Plus, like I said there's games that don't exist on board game geek like what we played on christmas eve i can't log a play of that the two games we're reviewing tonight i can't log plays of though i don't know how i'd log a play anyway but i at least log one if not multiple every time i sat down with it maybe i've had 82 plays i don't even know <laughs> but those weren't able to be logged so it looks like about 300 games um what impressed me was 79 different games and that always impresses me because people do these like 21 and 22, you know, whatever, like uh, 91 and nine in 1990 or whatever, where they try to play like so many different games. And I'm like, well, I played 79 different games this year. Um, and again, that's board game geek based. So I actually think it might be a little higher because of some of the games that aren't listed. Now, I will say both those numbers are lower than last year on both counts. But these were more in-person plays. I played a lot of board game arena last year. That was my main way to game. And it's really easy to try a new game on board game arena. How many things last year did we play once or we went on Yukata and tried to figure <laughs> out Bruges or whatever. So, so my number of games last year was significantly higher, but mainly because we were stuck at home and trying to kill time and trying to interact and try to do stuff with Sean. So we played games and we were trying all kinds of things. Yeah. So I've actually played 225 times this year, nice. but only 57 different ones. And those numbers are pretty accurate. I'm, I'm pretty persistent when it comes to logging. Mm. And I also don't, I, I haven't played the strange escape stuff that you guys yes. have. So <laughs> those, that hasn't, uh, well, strange for BGG. Um, yes. That hasn't thrown off my numbers by not being able to log mm -hmm. uh, that stuff. Now, Sadly, 75% of my games were still played on Board Game Arena. All right. Next, we're going to take these lists and we're going to break them down. And I think what we'll do is we'll do kind of a top 10. We don't usually do top 10. So I fear for this episode, let's do a top 10 because why not? These are going to be our 10 most played games. Um, we're going to say a little bit about each of them. I don't want to just run through the list and be done. I want to I want to say, you know, what we liked about them or whatever. Not a full-on description of how to play or what the games are about. Now, we're going to start at number 10. So this is our least played of the top 10 first, working up to our most played game. So number 10 for me, and, and this was a bit of a surprise, was Gorinto. I really love Gorinto. Gorinto is fantastic. Now, the reason this is so high this year is we were playtesting and trying out the new expansion, which unfortunately is a Barnes & Noble exclusive, which you can only get and when you buy the game at Barnes & Noble. But I will say it's a cool expansion. It adds like in areas where you can score more points if you take tiles from a certain area. Overall, though, we've said a ton about Corinto over the years. It's a fantastic abstract tile drafting game that we still enjoy. It's one I broke out to the barbershop bar and people loved it. I knew as soon as I got that game, the finished product out in people's hands. Now, ironically, I just realized this. Remember I said my last gaming event was in 2019? We brought the prototype of Gorinto <laughs> to that event and played it. Dude, and I just mode. realized that <laughs> our last public play event I hosted, I brought the prototype. My most recent public play event, I brought the production copy. So the how do you like that for service there, Mark, from uh, Grand Gamers Guild? That just clicked <laughs> in. I'm like, wait a minute. There we go. All right, what was your 10? So my number 10 was Lost Runes of Arnak. Uh, I, which I only actually got to play, I think, maybe once, maybe twice in I person think we did with twice. you. Uh, twice. 
And and that was interestingly, it was in the middle of my play. So I, I started playing it on Board Game Arena, struggled a little bit, <laughs> played it in person with you, and then understood it so much better oh, yeah. when we went back to it at Board mm -hmm. Game Arena. It's uh, definitely a game you want to learn in person <laughs> before playing, you know, unless unless you're the type who can learn from, you know, watch it play videos or, or whatever. I, for me, that game did not click for me until mm -hmm. I played it in person. Uh, so much of the components of that game matter. It's mm -hmm. just, it's a tactile game, even though there's nothing tactile or dexterous about it. Uh, but a uh, a good game, even though I don't necessarily agree that most people say it's a deck builder. Um, that's the the smallest portion of that game is the deck mm -hmm. building component. Uh, but yeah, that was my number ten. My number nine is Point Salad, and I actually am shocked this isn't higher up on the list. Though I have a feeling this is one where I logged one play for an entire night of play with multiple plays. So I think this probably should be higher on the list. It's one of those, like, I, I'm sure I logged every time the game came out. I'm just not sure I logged every play because what happens with Point Salad is we sit down and we play two, three, four, sometimes five times in a row. If it's just DNI, we tend to do the three game one to get your total score. And do you log that as one play because it's a two player variant or is that three plays of Point Salad? But anyway, I played a ton of Point Salad. This is a great game. I did not bring this one up to the barbershop bar, but Deanna did and taught one of our friends, taught, taught a local how to play who dug it. This is one I expect is going to be possibly on this list again next year. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me at all, especially um, if people figure out that it's on Board Game Arena. Uh, just mm -hmm. in general because it's so easy to play and you know whether you're playing it in person or playing it online it's really easy to just go to sit down and have a couple of plays of, yep. of uh point salad uh my number nine is deus um which is really interesting because i still don't know how to play deus uh it's the ninth most played game of the year i've still never read the instructions watched <laughs> and as it played um it's it's been interesting it's fun i like it as a game it's in uh but uh it, it's one of those games that came up on board game arena and we've played few, through it a few times and uh it seems obvious enough for the most part the first time through i had no idea what i was doing completely lost uh and i don't think any of us actually did <laughs> um but i i did pick up a couple of things and i think you'd mentioned a couple of things about it yeah just kind of how it works in passing yep. and i'm like oh Oh, well, that makes sense. Now I understand mm -hmm. why that whole section of the board that I never did anything with is there. Um, but yeah, so despite not understanding it very well at all, my ninth game was Deus. So I actually brought my copy up. I told I think it's a little too blurry to see in the video, but it's <laughs> it's behind my shelf back behind my shoulder back there. And we really should probably sit down and play a game. I just don't I don't think out, we'll do yeah. that this Friday, but just to <laughs> figure it out. I'll have to relearn it. I really I all I remember is you try to get the same type of gods because when you play one, they all go off, kind of like Gizmos. That's that's what I remember of it, and it had a weirdly shaped board. Yep. I don't remember much else. But yeah, Deus it, I have not played this even at all this year. I I don't know when I played my copy, <laughs> but I do have it, but I think it might have the arnak effect on sean and it'll suddenly make more sense all right my number eight is space base which doesn't surprise me at all uh this is just everyone likes this game uh from my kids including my youngest which doesn't always enjoy like this is this one's on the borderline for too complex for her but she loves it uh to my mother-in-law who loves this game i don't expect this one to change and this i haven't been able to bring out the public play events but i think once i do it's going to be even more popular, especially the high player counts. I think I might actually get like the command station. I'll get some use with some, you know, six, seven player games of Space Base. Um, my only mess up with Space Base, I totally forgot to put the new story expansion on my wish list this year for Christmas. Kind of should have did that because, man, we are loving Space Base. I don't think that's another one. I expect that my plays are just going to continue into the new year. Fair enough. Uh, so my number eight was Splendor. And again, this is digital. Uh, it's such a fantastic game, uh, what in person or digital again, it's, it's, it's like uh point salad in that way. It really plays perfectly well either way. Mm -hmm. Uh, the nice thing about digital is you don't have to clean it up afterwards <laughs> and, the, true. and the setup is, and the setup is super fast. Um, so no shuffling at all, but yeah, I, I love, I love Splendor and I was really glad to have it on that. They have it on BGA now so that I could get in a number of plays. Nice. 
Uh, seven was earlier on Sean's list. I played more Arnak than he did, which is kind of surprising based on how many PGA games we got going. But I think Sean was in every one I was in. I, Arnak's just great. Like, I, in, in this case, most of my plays were BGA, but there were a number of in-person plays. I think I did at least five in-person plays before we even did the digital. I don't know. Um, this is one of the few games that I kept playing on Board Game Arena after I basically stopped playing on Board Game Arena. It was the one that I would like, yeah, okay, let's go one more round. Okay, let's go one more round. <laughs> and if I got invited, I didn't turn it down and I kept playing. Uh, fantastic game. Um, I don't know what you call it. If it's not a deck builder deck, it's not deck construction. It's a card game with some deck. It's it's definitely not the focus. Yeah. I would not call it a deck building game, but it has deck building elements. It's much more. It's it's worker placement, resource management, engine building. Yep. Um. So yeah, definitely. Lost Ruins of Arnak is is on my list at number seven. And again, oh, I'm thinking seven seven plays. It's not seven <laughs> plays. It's probably more than that at yep. this point. Um. So yeah, Arnak still love it. What I'm not sure is how much more I'll keep playing that one with my physical copy. That is unless I pick up Expedition Leaders. I have a feeling if I pick that up, there's going to be a big push to start playing that one again. Fair enough. Uh, so my number seven is Tapestry. Uh, and thank God I got to play this in person first because <laughs> this one would be rough to try and learn digitally. Uh, I'm sure this is probably on one, uh, one of D's top games of the year, uh, played games of the year, considering she's gone on to do the tournament thing on Board Game Arena. But being able to play this in person a few times, and we've, we've played it more than oh, once yeah. in person, uh, and then take that knowledge and move it on to the, the digital version, which isn't perfect. Uh, the digital version has got some quirks to it, it because it's uh, a tricky some game. Of the it's, it's some a, of the ways you can't reverse, like things don't yeah. quite work the way you, that you wouldn't make those mistakes in person. That, yeah. That's what I found frustrating. Yeah, with that. No, I, absolutely. hundred percent. Uh, tapestry. I obviously got to in some plays this year. Love the game. Fantastic game. Just didn't make my top 10. <laughs> there. Sean is the Deanna is currently playing a tournament <laughs> exactly. game of yep. tapestry. Here we go. Uh, next one for me is the game, which I could make fun of its name. Oh, I guess I just did. Sorry. Um, this one, you can blame date nights um, and stayovers in Kingsville. Deanna and I have played a lot of two-player games of the game while enjoying great local beers and local food. Uh, the small package, small, very small table presence, like all you need is four stacks of cards, uh, simplicity of the gameplay. But not only that, I started playing this one with my kids more often. The, the few nights we had like board game night with the kids, this came out. So... I kind of shocked, like like in a way, but I still dig it. Like this is possibly the oldest game on my list that's still seeing that much play. Fair enough. Uh, for me, number six was Space Base, which we've already talked about. Uh, but I, because I didn't play through Pluto, right. uh, I played I played before and after and with Pluto, but not the play through of Pluto. I think that's why my uh, uh, is oh, a wait. little little. No, mine's actually higher than yours. Yo, then, yeah. no, you know what? That's right, because I was playing... You were playing on Board Game I was game playing Arena. on Board Game Arena when you weren't. Uh, yes. So even though you played Pluto, I have actually played this yeah, more than you. Say. But because of the... Uh, oh, well, well, maybe speak... not. It's re relatively. Not, yes. You may have actually it's... had more plays. Yeah, they said... The, the, I didn't look up the exact numbers. Yeah. Uh, so. Next, for me, number five would be Aldabas Doors of Cartagena. Uh, this is another one that Deanna and I like to play on date night games. I actually played surprisingly well two player. And often we would sit down, we'll play two or three rounds in a row. Also, my mother-in-law really enjoyed this one. So it became a popular one to bring over to Brenda's house. Um, also up there because to review it, we played multiple games to get the core game down, but then played more games to play with the expansion to be able to talk about that separately. So well, I got to say, this one's rough. Um, I feel sorry for Mark because this one is not winning fans over because there's some system mastery and rule mastery required to get into this game. I personally think it's worth it, but it's a hard sell to say, hey, you got to play this game two, three times before you really start to enjoy it. Most people would rather play a game that's fun right out of the box. So a little bit of a rough start for all the boss, but I've dug it. It is my number five most played game of 2022. My number five most played game is Sushi Go Party. Uh, they finally added this on Board Game Arena, and we jumped onto it as soon as that happened. Uh, it really is the better version, I think, mm -hmm. of Sushi Go. Not that there's anything wrong with Sushi Go, but the card variety and the fact that your card, the potential cards change 
every game just makes yep. it so much more enjoyable to play mm -hmm. over and over and over again. Uh, so I, you can't go wrong with Sushi Go Party. So that's one I should try to convince you to buy because it's one I don't have, but yeah, it'd be I should. for the public play events. Yeah, yeah I, I absolutely should. That, that one should be one I think should be in Sean's collection. Hey, we talked about this earlier. Yes, I played a lot of Tapestry. <laughs> I wouldn't have guessed it's so high. Um, I have more than 10 plays of a big epic game like that. But again, Board Game Arena gets the real credit for that. But I played a lot of physical games of Tapestry. Yeah. Uh, we played that with Tori and Cat. We played even Holly. Uh, Snail Runs in the chat has played Tapestry. We played a lot of Tapestry. Um, later on, though, we did move to mainly playing games online. And I started a new game of Tapestry whenever one finished and explored so many different factions. Fair enough. So my number four was uh, Tigris and Euphrates, a game that, again, I have never read the rules to. <laughs> oh, unlike, that game's rough. Unlike Deus, however, I'm actually pretty good at Tigris and Euphrates, uh, winning more than losing, uh, nice. despite never, figure, never actually reading the rules. This one does actually, it's easier to figure out. Things become more obvious, I think, than Deus does. It's pretty straightforward what you're doing. It's not easy. Um, yeah. a, we were playing, you know, four player game of this is there is cutthroat. Um, it's a, it's a rough game and I can definitely see a lot of people not enjoying this game, mm -hmm. but, um, I, I clearly enjoyed it enough despite not understanding it at first to, uh, to have it come in as my number four. I wonder if, um, does BGA have yellow and Yangtze? Because that is actually a follow-up to Tigris and Euphrates, where you theme to China instead of Egypt. Hmm. Um, that's supposed to be a little better. I'll have to see. I just wonder. So Tigris and Euphrates, the story I have about this one is I've been on Board Game Arena more longer than most people. I joined in 2002, I think it was. And back then, the number one game in the world was Twilight Imperium. Or not Twilight, yeah, Twilight, Twilight Struggle. Sorry, I'm confusing the two. Twilight Struggle, <laughs> the Russia versus U.S. card game, war game. Some people get upset I called it a war game. Um, and the number two game was Tigris and Euphrates. And Board Game Geek had licensed the game from Nizia. And underneath the, the old logo for Board Game Geek, before they switched to the guy running with the checkerboard, was a button to play Tigris and Euphrates. And I tried to do that. And it just pissed off people on Board Game Arena because they were taking the game way too seriously and I was obviously playing wrong. And that that is my history with it. But because of that, I'm like, oh, this is like this heavy, hard chess lovers love it. Huge strategy game. I go to go buy a copy of it. So I went and picked up a copy of Tigris and Euphrates, which is behind me. It's just right above my thumb there. Um, and I think I tried to play it twice and didn't like it at all. <laughs> So maybe Sean needs to teach me Tigris, even though he hasn't played read the rules for Tigris. Yeah, maybe I'll have point. to read the rules to actually teach them. But I, you know, I, I, I'm actually, I was actually decent at it. So maybe, yeah. I, maybe I can work. An interesting it out. one. Yeah. Uh, next one makes perfect sense. Charterstone, because well, we played 13 times, 12 times to finish the campaign, and one more to try it after we finish the board in order to do up our full review. Um, since then, I did pick up the recharge pack, so this might be on the list at 12 plays in 2023. Uh, number three for me, Azul. Uh, sadly, not physically. Um, <laughs> but thank God the Board Game Arena added this game, because I love Azul. It's mm -hmm. such a fantastic game, and if I can't play it physically, at least the implementation on Board Game Arena is as close as you can get except for wanting to throw the little tiles in your mouth because they look like candies. Yep. Uh, my number two is Azul. So um, I know I said I didn't play much board game arena, but I really did uh, less this year than last year, but I played a lot of Azul. There were a few months there where we just had two to three games of Azul going at once. And the big thing we were doing was diving into it on the um, the blank side. We played a lot of games on the blank side, which I was terrible at. And I honestly admit by the time we finished all those games as well, I think I was worse at the game than when I started. <laughs> um, but yeah, a lot of as well, um, some physical play. My, my physical copy did get played, um, but mostly on board game arena. I'm still, I'm, I'm a little shocked that it, that it was that high up number two. I didn't realize we played that much as well, but it's so <laughs> quick. Like it's not a long game. And if you, DN and I happen to all be on the computer and live, we'd fire through two, three games in a row. Yeah, no, oh, Absolutely. 
Now, when it comes to quick games, uh, one that doesn't always seem quick on Board Game Arena, but actually turns out to be pretty quick, uh, especially if you may have three or four games going at once, it turned out, uh, is Go Nuts for Donuts. Uh, another great party game, and again, a, a game that's just so easy to, you know, throw off a turn now and then on Board Game Arena that you just lose track of how much you're actually playing the game, it turns <laughs> out. Uh, so yeah, I have played a whole lot of Go Nuts for Donuts this year. And honestly, I've never played the game. I haven't even tried it on Board Game Arena. I have never played Go Nuts for Donuts. All right, my number one played game of the entire year of 2022, not counting the games we're probably going to play Friday night, New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve is technically like if we don't start till midnight, it'll count for next year's <laughs> list. We'll see when I log my plays where they fall. Um, my number one game, and I don't think that'll change before the end of the year, is Codenames Duet. Um, this one also gets blamed on date night gaming for the most part. This was actually Deanna and I's favorite game to play with some charcuterie and craft beer and sitting hanging out. Um, we even went and got like the not safe for work pack, which I strongly recommend not picking up um, because it was date nights. So we thought that'd be fun, but it's just mostly dumb. We took like half the cards out because it was more about like drugs and violence than interesting, sexy things. Uh, so yeah, don't can't, can't recommend Undercover, I think it's called. But yeah, we played a lot of Codenames Duet, uh, especially early in the year. Um, but we also played the game with the kids and Tori and Kat, our usual game group, because we ended up loving the co-op version, like the, the not two-player, the team-based, really team fun team-based game. And that's when it replaced Codenames for me. Like I literally threw out my Codenames box and I stole the cards from it. Like, technically, I have the clue cards if we want to use them. But yeah, so Codenames Duet, my most played game. I, If you would ask me, that wouldn't even been in my top 10, like, if I was thinking about it. But that's another one where you, like, play a round, play another round, play another round, play another round, especially if you lose right away. Now, yep. the other thing is Deanna had made a pocket pack, and we condensed ours down to one Ziploc bag that she'd throw in her purse, and that's what we bring to Kingsville. So we'd be playing in the hotel room. We'd be playing at Bandit Goose. We'll be playing at the Grove Brewery. And it's it's never one round. You always at least flip the cards and play a second round. And I will say our average game of Codenames Duet is actually four rounds because we'll play a set, flip the cards, and we'll put a new set of cards, flip those, and then usually we move on to something else. So it was up there. Like like number of plays was, was multiple digits. <laughs> and I'm like, it's got to be because of that because I actually logged each of those as separate plays. Right. Uh, my number one, I probably would have guessed. Uh, because yes. up until they released Sushi Go Party, Sushi Go was the one that had three or four games going at once, mm -hmm. constantly playing over and over again. So every day I would be taking at least one turn on three or four different games of Sushi Go. Uh, so the, the play count on that one ranked up real fast, uh, even though we were down to maybe, I think there's maybe one game of it sort of going on in the background still, uh, despite all the Sushi Go Party going on. Mm -hmm. um so yeah sushi go uh again it party is better but uh there's still nothing wrong with the original so is your online group you play with now switched completely to party or do you still have games of go there's going one game of go that has never ended which we just keep go. restarting it over and over again yep. with eric and the gang i will say one thing that's kind of nice compared to previous years is seven wonders is not on my list at all <laughs> we finally got out of yep. that rut where all three of us just kept like playing Seven Wonders indefinitely on Board Game Arena. Yeah. I don't know how it happened, but somehow an invite got missed, and finally that well, stopped. I, I, it's funny some of these some of these games, you know, a lot of the group the group will just move on to something else, and we won't play that game anymore. Uh, yeah. Even if no one is is actively turning down invitations, sometimes it's it's oh no, I really don't want to play that anymore. But yeah. a lot of times it's just you know no, we played that a bunch. Let's move on to something else. Fair enough. All right. So there's our top 10 played games. I top 20. I don't know how many different games. It wasn't 20 because we did no, have wasn't. a bit of overlap. Yeah, it was 15 um, in there or something like that. <laughs> 15 or so games we played the most in 2022 with a mix of in-person and digital gaming. Next up, how many of these games were new to us? Uh, new to me games. And for me, it was over half. I, I was actually surprised by that. It was better than I expected. Um even though they weren't all new games, which we'll get to a minute, as in like most recently released, um, some are fairly older. Forty-eight of the games 
were new to me. So 48 brand new game discoveries in one year to me is pretty good. I know it's nothing compared to the number of games that are released in a year, but for me, when we're still, you know, I'm not hosting a ton of public play events. I didn't go to any cons. 48 games is pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that. Absolutely. And I was only a few less with 40 new to me games nice. this year. Uh, and given that I couldn't always play many that we reviewed, only eight fewer than you feels pretty good to me. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I'm happy with that. I'm really happy with that. Now, the next thing I wanted to talk about was my biggest surprise. It's something we've done every time we've done one of these lists. And my biggest surprise of the year is, but you know what? There were too many, like there, and they were pleasant. Like there, there was no shockingly bad thing that happened, at least not as far as gaming goes. Um, I just I can't pick one this year, so I'm I'm gonna cheat and and list off a few pleasant surprise the most pleasant gaming surprises of 2022 um not in any particular order so the first one is that big box over my shoulder right there which would be scythe from stonemeyer games um the fact they gave it a second chance isn't really a surprise i've been meaning to do that for years i have to thank jamie stegmeyer for finally giving me the opportunity to give the game a chance and i thought maybe that first experience didn't go so well and i might like the game i didn't expect to fall in love with this game like like this is a fantastic game the components are fantastic every time i play it i enjoy it i try different strategies i love the miniatures and little things like plastic things can fight and wooden things can carry and there's so much awesome design work in there two layer player boards just really impressed by Scythe. Not only that, I have to love Scythe because somehow it has become the most popular thing on our blog now is my Scythe review. So I don't know why, like, I'm glad other people are still discovering Scythe this many years later. So I don't know. I, I know, like, I'm late to the party. It's 2022 and I'm talking about Scythe, but that was a huge surprise to me. Not that I liked it. I had a feeling, like, knowing I like other Stonemaier games, type of games I like, but just how much I like Scythe. Yeah, and, and this one comes in for me as well. Well, I hadn't played it physically. The digital game, which everyone had, you know, gone on and on and on about, it's just as disappointing for me as, you know, uh, as Mo had felt about uh, playing it in person. Uh, and until I played it with the gang down in Windsor, I didn't get the game. It just mm -hmm. had completely not clicked for me. It wasn't enjoyable. I didn't want to try the, <laughs> the the digital version further to try and find a way to enjoy it because it just it hadn't it hadn't felt right. right. Uh, and then playing it with the right people made me understand the game a little better and and why I wasn't struggling with uh, the the strangeness of it. It was you know explained well and and clearly and. It was just fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. Heck, I even played that one solo. I don't do that very often. <laughs> now, have you gone back to the digital version now that we played a bunch? I, I have gone back a couple of times. It's not installed right now because it's just... I'm just something. wondering if it's worth picking up if you're a fan of the other... If the, the fan of the physical version and know I, it. I, I think so. I think it really is. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a good implementation of it. Nice. All right, another big surprise for me was Gunkimono or Gunkimono. We we had a way to pronounce this. We looked it up at the time. Gunkimono. Gunkimono. Um, this is a fantastic abstract strategy game that I would have missed. I would have never touched this game. I would have never looked at this game. I probably would have forgot its name eventually. The only reason I even tried this is a local gamer was purging their collection and I bought a lot of games off them. Like a lot is in like an, an eBay <laughs> lot of stuff, but it was also a lot of games, <laughs> but <laughs> I bought them and, and there was a huge number of renegade games in that collection for a good reason. And it was just one in the pile. And I'm like, Oh, well, let's see. I opened it up i'm like eh, it's already punched let's try this out and deanna and i played and i was like is it just me or was that really good she's like yeah let's play again and then we finished the second game and i'm like all right now i'm seeing some stuff i missed the first couple you want to go again and like that doesn't happen often with, with a bigger game like with a point salad sure but like we're looking at out i don't know if it's an hour play two players but whatever 45 minutes to an hour game that we wanted to play again and then we're like okay let's see if it's good with three. Oh yeah it's good with three. okay let's try it with four okay we got to try it with five and the, the way the map is all hilly and mountainy at five so yeah big surprise for me and and a big hit was gunkimono well, all right then. Well, for me, I'm going to go with a more recent discovery, which was Cowboy Bebop. Now, being a fan of deck builders and the anime, I 
sort of been expecting to enjoy it. Yeah. But that was about as high as my expectations had run. To discover that they had introduced new mechanisms into a deck building game and done inventive things with it for a mm -hmm. licensed title deck builder that could have just been your generic deck builder with all the flood trimmings of uh of cowboy bebop really made this stand out as a fantastic game even without the license mm -hmm. uh, and then you add the license in and the fact that they it's it's themed well with the license really made this game stand out and just to be clear that's cowboy bebop space serenade as there are multiple cowboy bebop games out there, there. yes uh, for me, the next one is Pocketbook Adventures, which I misplaced. So one problem with Pocketbook Adventures is it's a small book. It's somewhere in this room. I would be holding it up right now. Uh, this is a solo-only game. This is this is a single-player thing. And honestly, I would not argue too hard if someone said it's not a board game, but rather like a puzzle, like crossword puzzle book, I, which is kind of a fair argument. But this ended up being the perfect thing for me to play while sitting in my van. And honestly, it's something I do a lot. Uh, people have appointments. My daughters have therapy. They have music. They have things they go to. And I spend a lot of time sitting in my van. That's usually where I read rule books. When I don't feel like reading something, this was an awesome thing for me to be able to sit and play. Um, now, f in all fairness, I played this in 2022. You can't get it. So uh, for me, this this was a 22, 2022 surprise. So glad that I got to check this out. And yes, I really pushed the Kickstarter when it was live because I really enjoyed this. I think this is one of the, a great time waster. But then if you ever in your life subscribed to Games Magazine or went to the corner store and went, oh, I'm going to buy an issue of Games Magazine and had fun with it, you're going to love Pocketbook Adventures. All right, well, staying on theme for me, Chiseled, the opposite of a deck builder, I guess, was mm. so much more than expected. Oh, yeah. Uh, rather than a simple, oh, how cute that is game that was kind of what we expected, it, it, it played, but uh, we, we never expected to really sort of play it again. You know, five plays, it's done. Here we go. Okay, we, mm -hmm. we'll review this. It's fun. Everyone enjoys it. We're never going to play it again. I would play this game just about any time. And the fact that it's super easy to teach mm -hmm. means that, you know, it's a fantastic game for public play events and such. Uh, and it looks good on the table. It doesn't it doesn't stand out from a distance, but people walking by are definitely going to notice the game. Yeah, that one was a huge hit when I we brought that out to the Barbershop Bar event, our only public play event this year. Uh, played two rounds of it. A great game. All right. Next for me is Marvel Champions. Uh fantasy flight living card game that i actually liked i think that's why it's a shocker like i i've tried many out I, I should like them i played magic i i don't even play i played magic i played jihad i played um galactic frontiers was one of my favorite i even played wing commander the collectible card game i was all about those back in the day and i quit because of the collectible nature so living card game should be my jam but everyone i try i just can't get into I, I tried Netrunner, I tried the Star Wars one, I tried the War Machine one, I tried all kinds of them. I tried Legend of the Five Rings and I just couldn't get hooked. I think in this case, I may have found a living card game that's actually for me. Now, at this point, I'm only just starting to explore this one. Maybe it's ill-deserved. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm talking too quick, but I don't think so. And then there was Smash Up Disney, which despite its branding was not an nope. easier version of Smash Up at all all <laughs> merely one that was just as in-depth as any other smash up offering but featuring fun disney characters <laughs> and, oh. and this was this was fun and again the 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 timing of discovering this um uh, as i had i had just just discovered marvel snap uh, yeah, made timing. for a nice synchronicity uh because while they aren't the same there's enough similarities that my my headspace was in the right place yep. to sit down and really get smash up. And there's more, there's tons like, like the, how much we actually enjoyed our campaign in Charterstone. I actually thought that was going to be a slog based on other reviews I'd seen or how damn good cowboy bebop space serenade is. Sean's already called it out. It is so good. It is one of the best deck builders I ever played or I totally missed that. I would have never guessed this was 2022, but it ends up, we played this on new year's Eve after midnight and that was WWE superstar showdown. It's actually a good game. 
It needs <laughs> expansions, but it's a good game. It's a licensed WWE game that's good. Like that, th- those words shouldn't go together. It's it's baffling. <laughs> You know, with the number of games we play, especially with the need to cycle through games rapidly for reviews for this show, uh, without the ability to play over and over at event the way things used to work, Mm -hmm. it's been hard to keep track of all the ups and downs these last couple of years. Thank goodness for Board Game Geek and BG Stats, the app, for helping be our memories during these times. Yeah, shout out to BGG for me. I still don't use BG stats. I should. I keep meaning to install it, and I never do. <laughs> um, I, I got to answer more Google surveys, and then when I get it up there, I'll, I might actually have to do that. So overall, there were so many new discoveries last year. Out of all of those, though, if I had to pick one game to top them all, my 2022 game of the year that has nothing to do with 2022 other than the fact I played it for the first time in 2022 has got to be Lost Ruins of Arnak. It is one of my most played games, and for all the right reasons. It does everything right. Every game is engaging. Every game is fun. It changes things up. It's replayable. I like the way it makes me think. I love eking out that combo of one more action that leads to another action that i go up on the track and when i go up the track i get the thing to spend the thing to buy the card that lets me do this other thing that lets me put my worker here i love that feeling in that game that that logic puzzle i guess of the game no other game compares for making me feel smart after a big move like that (laughs) and you do love engine builders which is really i mean that's really what we should be calling arnak not deck builder it's an engine builder um mm-hmm. it's it's just an an engine builder of a wide range of other mechanisms yep so i really can't disagree with that uh for myself as well though i have to say if i had been in windsor i probably would have tried to make dune imperium <laughs> the arnak because while i like arnak um I'm the sci-fi guy. I like the sci-fi games and I am a lover of Dune. Uh, Not only the game, but also the, uh, the entire license. So I would have probably uh, leaned on playing a little more Imperium and a little less Arnak, but Arnak is available on board game arena. So it had the advantage this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dune Imperium. I've only still played twice. So that one, we're still just scratching the surface. All right. I know we try to keep things positive here, um, and uh, but I know everyone also always wants to hear it, right? Um, my biggest disappointment of 2022 would be the Tales from the Loop, the board game. I love Tales from the Loop. I love the setting. I love Steinman Stylenhog's artwork. I love his art books. I love the role-playing game. No, I still haven't watched the Amazon series, so I can't tell you on that one. I keep forgetting it exists. I love the premise. I love kids on bikes. I had no clue. Before playing a game of Tales from the Loop at a con with Sean, um, I would have said, I don't want to play kids in the 80s. I was a kid in the 80s. I don't want to do that in a game. But it was so fun. I love the look of this game. It looks like it nails Tales from the Loop. Yeah, it would have been kind of cool if it was in Denver and not in Sweden because I don't have to worry about pronouncing things. But the components were awesome. The little miniatures were great. The characters were right from the role-playing game. The stats were right from the role-playing game. It just felt like it should have been amazing. And it didn't live up to any of those expectations. And I don't even think we were being unreasonable with the license that's there, with the design team, with the role-playing game, and the tying it together, this should have been a good game. Yeah, unfortunately, it just, it failed. I, 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 I think I know what they were doing. I think I know what they were going for. And it was just a swing and a miss, which happens sometimes. And, and yep. it's, it's unfortunate, mostly, I think, because we do love the property. Mm -hmm. Um, If it had just been some, you know, some property none of us cared about, we'd be, oh, look, it was another game. It didn't work. Oh, well, moving on. But we do love Tales from the Loop. And so it hurts that much more when something in that world doesn't work. (laughs) Yep. Now, with that, as a more general disappointment is, I'm going to say, rule books. (laughs) Now, while most of the larger publishers have got this sort of thing pretty well handled, Many of these smaller publishers, uh, not just the, uh, you know, the independents, 
still are what making to me are unforgivable errors in rule books on delivery. Even if all the rules do happen to be in the rule book, if you can't find them when you need them, what's the point? Yeah. And we're not just talking about Kickstarters and prototypes here. Published games that we have purchased that are available on retail shelves. If experienced hobby gamers like us with years of experience are having difficulty figuring out your game, there's a problem. All right. So far, all the games we talked about were new to us games or games we played in the past that we got in more plays in 2022, but haven't actually talked about actual 2022 games. Um, many of the games we're talking about, like Scythe and Arnak, were actually released quite some time ago. Now, I'm going to use Board Game Geek for this, for the release dates, which I don't quite understand. Like Horizon Zero Dawn supposedly is a 2020 game. Is that when the Kickstarter was live? Yeah, so that's I the problem with Board Game Geek is the editor goes in and says, or you know, whoever goes in and says, well, we're starting this game, and they need to it has to be a, a date in the now, really. You can't right. or, or near future. Um, and so the games that are, you know, if you can if people have the game and have, are playing it, the date has to be then. So you, you know, if re reviewers are playing your game. It has to be released. So yeah. even though it wasn't necessarily on shelves, if someone was playing it, it, it was released, I guess. And the added complication is we are reviewers, and sometimes we are sent games from publishers, and we do sometimes get stuff before it's in retail. So we may play it before other people get it too. So it's kind of a mess. So I used BGG's number, wherever it comes from, whatever it's based on, using that. And this is sad. I only played six games that were released in 2022. Like, like that just, uh, I, 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 we joke about us not being about the new hotness, but I didn't realize we were that far off the mark. <laughs> um, so you know what? There's only six. So we might as well talk about each of them quickly. Um, all the boss. I already talked about all the boss, everything you need to know about all the boss, all the boss doors of Cartagena from grand gamers guild. Um, next up was Mountains Out of Mole Hills, which is a family weight programmed movement game with great table presence from the op, um, which probably might have been in my most played games if more time had gone by. We only tried this one recently. Um, next is Boba Mahjong. This is a three player set collection game uh, with a unique scoring system from Sunrise Tornado, who we loved Macaron, a trick taking game from. This is obviously Tate Wu is the designer is all about taking traditional card games and doing interesting new things from them. And I can't wait to see what he has to do next. Uh, next is another op game. Well, actually, we have a lot of op games here. Four of these are op. Okay, obviously the op sent us review copies it's kind of funny now that i see it here in front of me uh next would be ven a venn diagram based word and art driven party game that now is the game that the kids at my daughter's grade or high school love because that's what she brings with her on board game weeks now um next disney sorcerer's arena a disney themed skirmish battle game that we're just starting to discover and finally smash up disney edition which sean talked about earlier yeah, as well as Aldous, uh Boba Majong, we did both plays Tales from the Loop, which is a 2022 game. Um, see, when I looked it up, it wasn't listed as 2022, oh, I thought. See, I had it as a 22. I had it listed uh, as a 2022. See, I don't I even know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that was for better or worse on Tales from the Loop. Uh, interestingly, I actually have a different uh, 2022 game that you haven't played, which is uh, the trick-taking game Las Vegas which came out this year, though my plays were, of course, only digital. See, I couldn't even find that one on Board Game Geek. Is that a real game? Yeah, yeah, it's on Board Yeah, it's a real game. It's a real or, sorry, game. Not board, yeah, I couldn't find it on Board Game Geek. Yeah, it's on It's on there. Okay. I, they all, all my, all my plays, because I, I, because Board Game, BG Stats publishes to Board Game Geek, right. I, I can still go in and, and check all oh. my plays from Board okay. Game Geek, and I, I tabbed open everything. See, I actually thought you started playing Las Vegas, which I think is a Nizia game, but it's a dice game. <laughs> nope. Right? Whereas, as you're saying, trick-taking games, so that's not it. And honestly, like, probably on that list should be Horizon Zero Dawn, but again, we barely played it. Now, I gotta say, one of the reasons we didn't get to as many is because of October, November. There was stuff we had on the plate to be played before the end of the year that fell through just because those two months were horrible, void of terribleness so we 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 didn't even record podcast during that time there was no gaming going on so there would have been more on here like we had uh the three different valeria games so we had some other stuff i had hoped to get played 
So out of the ones I have played from 2022, uh, I think Mountains on the Molehills would be my favorite. Excuse me. I think Mountains on the Molehills would be my favorite, uh, both because the kids love it and because I think this is going to be fantastic for public play events. Yeah, you know what? While I enjoyed most of the uh, 2022 games I played this year, uh, most, not all, um, <laughs> I, I found them not quite in hitting any sweet spot. Um, realistically, I wouldn't say any of them are my favorites. Uh, the okay. game, most of the games that really did it for me this year were older games. We were just fin finally trying yeah. to, uh, explore. Yeah. And I have a feeling we're going to be talking about a lot of 2022 games next year. We're going to finally get to pick up some of these games. People have been hyping now while looking up these games. I did realize we also, I also have plays of games that don't exist. Um, uh, they were Kickstarter previews where we played the games, but you can't get them yet. Um, in one case, it's a game that funded, but the other actually didn't fund. Um, I, and there's more of those, actually, like The Earth is Ours or whatever it was called. I can't remember now. The, the time travel game. Mm. Now, the thing is, these are both solid games that I would recommend. And I think Sean would even recommend the first one, which is Hellbringer. This is a roguelike Diablo-based card game meant for solo play that can be played with more players, though we don't didn't really love it with more players. Uh, we both really enjoyed this one solo, and we're really sad to see it not fund in its first attempt. Now, the designer, though, has realized some of the issues with his first launch, I think, and has big plans, plans for a relaunch. And we're not getting anything out of this, but I'm definitely going to be promoting it when it comes out, because I think more people deserve to play this game. If you are a fan of roguelike deck builders and dig card mechanics and battlers killing lots of monsters, I think you're going to really like this game. Yeah, absolutely. And March 1st is currently the date it's scheduled to go live again on Kickstarter. So we'll see what's on offer in the new funding attempt. And then the other one I already talked about a bit above is Pocketbook Adventures. This is one I honestly wish I had backed just so Dee and Sean could have their own copies. I should have bought like the five pack <laughs> and given them out to people as gifts or something this year. I just want to compare scores. I want to know how many hearts everyone gets by the end. They're like, how'd you do against the first orc boss? Did you manage to get the treasure chest? Yeah, you know, the solitude of it doesn't go well with our group uh, in general, though it has been great for your waiting time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's been great for me, so I don't know. So the one thing we haven't talked about at all here is role-playing games. Don, I know you were running games, at least earlier in the year. Yeah, no, there's, um, it, it's been, <laughs> it isn't just you, uh, us that have had rough, uh, rough falls. Yeah. It's, it's been that way for a lot of people. So both of my game, both the game of masks I'm playing in and running have had some hiccups over the last couple of months. But there, I am still involved in, in two masks games, uh, one both, one as GM and one as player. See, that's awesome. Anything other than masks or just masks this year? Sadly, uh, just masks. Um, I, <laughs> I can't wait to get back to a con and, and do some one-offs and learn some more stuff. And while well, I do need to find some time, I need, the, the one thing that hasn't happened since I've moved down to Windsor is I haven't found a reading time. Um, right. I used to have a couple of specific times where I would sit down and read a new RPG. Uh, and that hasn't happened here so i'm falling behind and i i'm not at a point where i feel even remotely comfortable i could do another superheroes episode right. despite having new games that i could talk about um or new to Fair me enough. games at least but uh hopefully i'll i'll, I'll find a rhythm and uh you know maybe a, maybe a sunday afternoons after brunch i sit down and read a book there you go you gotta we gotta find a coffee shop that's open after four and oh, then tell me about it <laughs> Tallulah Cafe is probably your best bet. Tallulah right. near near uh, Walkerville there. Uh, so sadly, this year, I didn't play anything. I didn't run anything. None. Zero. Zip. Nada. I just double-checked. I'm like, there had to be something. I guess those were all last year. Um, Runaway Hirelings. I guess that was last year. Must yeah. have been. Yeah, it was. Wow. So yeah, nothing. Nothing. Nada. Um, now, to be fair, I tend to only play RPGs at cons, and I didn't go to money. So that's not that strange. No, for the queen, there has to be on there. The night we played with Tori and Cat, that was this year. It's got to be this year. Is it listed as a board game? Is that the problem? Is it not on RPG Geek? Probably. I wonder if that's what it is. I swear for the queen was this year. Deanna will probably correct me in the chat, but I could have sworn it was. 
Yes, yeah, that, that was, was this year. year. So yeah. yes, we had a fantastic, amazing game of For the Queen. So my best RPG experience this year was blowing Tori's mind by playing For the Queen because uh, you had to be there. What? What's happening? This is the game? Are we playing right now? What's my character? That that was absolutely amazing. <laughs> is this the game? Did we win? Did we win? <laughs> Oh, I, 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 I just, I'm smiling about it right now. <laughs> Those that can't see me live, I got a big grin right now just thinking about that game. So, yes. Now, what I did do is read some RPGs. I did get some new RPGs. We reviewed some RPGs. So, we had the Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Starter Set, which looks amazing. Warhammer 4th Edition looks like Warhammer 1st Edition improved, I got to say. Uh, but, wow, it's it's Warhammer. It's not d d it, it, There's very little hand-holding going on. There's very little onboarding. It just kind of throws you in head first and warhammer's always been like that 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 is not an intro module but to be honest i cut my teeth on the enemy within so uh, the the reason i am the dm now is possibly because of being tossed in with here's just all the stuff here's what <laughs> the bad guys are doing you got some characters go because that's kind of how it's presented um so yeah i've been working through the one ring and I got to say, it looks amazing. The One Ring starter set, another, like I love RPG box sets, but these are amazing, amazing RPG box sets. The One Ring starter, I had hoped to start a game. That was another October, November um, casualty there. We had we were planning to start up a game of the One Ring. So most excited to play. Best, best RPG I read, it's got to go to One Ring. One Ring had the onboarding. One Ring had a fantastic story. The way they limited that box down to just the Shire and the Hobbits was amazing. And James Spawn's writing, Obi Spawn Kenobi's writing for the Hobbit book is is off the charts. Really uh, and, impressed. And by the that. content in that box. I mean, there was oh, yeah. just so much. Uh huh. So yeah, best best RPG of the year. I didn't get to play it. I didn't get to run it but I'm going to give it to the one ring starter set. Is that actually, that even might be a 2022 release. Mm, possibly. Might, yeah. Might be. This, this is the part of the show. I didn't research. Cause I realized, <laughs> Hey, we didn't talk about RPGs at all. And we both, well, it's because we don't really both play RPGs right now, Yeah, but we were. So, so yeah. I, I'm going to jump over to the chat room here. So is there any other categories you can think of or anything the chat room can think of that we haven't covered something you want to know about that we played in 2022 uh, i know uh pax is saying at one point the thing we need to work on in the uh, in the new year is the sean must playlist <laughs> yes oh, i know what i should do is maintain what you did play off that list so so mm. off the top of my head we'll get sean's opinions on the games i showed him and the biggest <laughs> one being anachrony right which was fantastic i mean that game talk about a game like a tough concept for any game to handle yeah. is time travel. And I mean, it just knocks it out of the park. Um, yep. It's one of those, why do I want to play any other games? Time travel. That game. time travel? Uh, yeah. This one just did it right. Yeah. Send yourself resources from the future, but make sure you pay them back in later turns. That's pretty much the concept. Yeah. And sometimes you don't want to, because paradoxes aren't always terrible. Yeah, no, it, it's got so many wonderful mechanisms and it's not just the time travel i mean all the you know the waking up your your troops yes. and, and, and yeah this... how do you wake them up do you, do, you, do you just get up get up or do you feed them yeah, yeah no there's all this fantastic stuff and we've still really only kind of scratched the surface oh yeah <laughs> well the amount of expansion content i own for that game i've never touched is actually shameful yes. um Eclipse, I think, was last year. I don't think we got that. That didn't show up on my playlist. So I think we did yeah, no, Second that, Dawn that last year. I don't think that showed up on mine either. So, yeah. Yeah. So Anachrony, I think, was the big one that I got off the Sean, excuse me, Sean Must playlist. A lot of it was, was stuff we already talked about, right? Scythe was one. Arnak was one. Dune Imperium was one. Uh, we already know Sean preferred Dune Imperium over <laughs> over Arnak, at least for what he got to see. Gorinto in person, I know, was a big one playing the production copy. Um, I think there was an Azul version you hadn't played. Tapestry was another one. Like we got through a lot of them. What I need to do is get Sean to play the classics, but then I think we have to be in the right mood. I think we need a bigger game night well, there, where we play. There was a little bit of that, and I'm trying to go through because there was the night, uh, the weekend like that we, we did played. One night. Eighteen twenty one. Did you play Concordia with us? Uh, no, but the Castles of Burgundy came out. Yeah. Uh, so we got that going. Uh, Castle of Burgundy, eighteen twelve. The, the yeah. whatever it was called. Yeah. Yeah. Not 1812. That's uh, more 18, of 18. 1928. Or 1928, making of the present. Now, wow. I can't even remember, <laughs> I can't what it is even now. remember now. Steffenfeld game. 
vote yeah. the uh, election, famous election in the states, revolution, yes. something. Yes. Uh, but <laughs> what? Bad. Oh, because it was um, sanctum. We finally got sanctum. Oh, uh, yeah, you had put, never played that. I hadn't That's played right. sanctum, uh, and there was something else. Zolkin. Or was oh it? yeah, was Zolkin this year? Yeah, that was Zolkin. Was on okay. uh, that was B. Yeah, it was Zolkin, and then. See, that's one um, I forgot to log. Uh, what else? Um, trying to find my, I can find the right list. There's too many ways of looking at. Uh, uh, where's my insights? Insights. There we go. There's the. Because well, it's only going to be like one or two play games, but because uh, we played the mind, we played the game. Um, yeah, Sean did not like the mind much. <laughs> I remember that. Uh, play Rack, Racco, lots of Racco. Um, surprised yep. that didn't show up more on your list. Uh, <laughs> Terror, I, I, Terror Below, we got out of the way. Um, Terror Below, you want to play again though? I do, we yes. played that way too late. That that one doesn't count. Uh, Alien Frontiers. Um, or there was something else that we did that because there was. When we did All Sanctum, right. yeah, I don't know. I, I think we'll stop this. But we did play Sanctum. Yes, we did that, which you liked quite a bit, if I remember correctly. Yeah. yeah. And oh, Super Motherload. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I remember we played that. Yeah. So this was all back in May, which is why we're struggling right now to remember yeah, that's... all this. This was this was back in May. So. Uh, I gotta um... admit, I had multiple pages to look through, and I was I was looking at my most played. I, I didn't talk too much about games. I only played once. Yeah. All right, I think we're good then. I didn't say any new categories to look at. I'm going to come up with one more. What was the most beautiful game you played? What was the game you were just like, oh, my God, this looks so good? Oh, wow. Um, That's tough. I'm thinking Bebop. With, with the miniatures and yeah. the three different planets yeah, and the card know, art. They, they went like, over and above. It wasn't striking. Like, like Horizon Zero Dawn looks amazing. But something about Bebop, because it doesn't need to be in Bebop, I think. Right. Horizon Zero Dawn, Seam Forge, and they're supposed to look like that. I think Bebop might be my top pick for for best art. Yeah, what so is just stills from the show? Yeah, it's hard. To, they they went over and above though. They didn't yeah, have to it, do it was any yes. of that. Any of what they did on that game. The um, fact that there's not just a giant board that takes up your whole table. Yeah, like the like the design and everything that goes with the dual layer boards to hold stuff. Again, you know, we talked about it before. We it almost had to have been a Kickstarter that someone said, I, "No, I no, swear. let's just sell them. Let's just give it to everyone." <laughs> like, like it's just so weird. The fact you get your cardboard standees and miniatures in that one. Yeah, it, it's it's that that box again. That opening up that box and playing the game are both a delight. Yeah, <laughs> they really are. They really it are. really is good. Maybe that should have been my game of the year. I really liked Arnak though. <laughs> Now, now I might have reshifted it. This I should have said the game of the year for right now because <laughs> tomorrow morning I'll be like, oh my god, this is so good. Yeah. Well, I think that's it for our look back at uh, 2022. How many games did you get in last year? What were your favorites? What surprised you? Let us know in the comments or on social media. And if you didn't play 300 games, that's perfectly fine. If you only played five games last year, that's still awesome. Please don't consider us a benchmark to beat. And plus, I don't want to hear that you played 3,000 more than I did either. <laughs> the number of games doesn't matter. It's the fun you had playing them. Absolutely. Remember, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. If you got a question for us, head over to tabletopbellhop.com. Click on Ask the Bellhop. Fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or hit me up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Well, before we get to the next segment, let's check in with a lot of you. Our chat room here on Twitch to see how their 2022 went. If you couldn't be here live but would love to hear this chat, all you have to do is become a hotel guest at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Welcome to our spoiler-free review of two different puzzle boxes from Escape Wealth. Earlier this month, Escape Wealth, a wooden puzzle company from Germany, sent us a few of their puzzles to check out. These included two escape boxes, as they called them, escape room-style puzzles. The first is House of the Dragon, and the other is called the Fort Knox box. These puzzle boxes are made out of laser-cut birch and come fully assembled. Each of them was originally funded through Kickstarter on separate projects, 
but are now available through retail. Over at Escape Welt's website, they have a list price of about $100 US, which is more than double what they sold for on Kickstarter. Now that said, since starting to work with them, I've been on their website many times, and it seems like they may be doing one of those permanent sale things. Uh, right now, both these boxes are 50% off at $49.99. That is direct from Escape Welt, which is a much more reasonable price, I would say. Now, we've also spotted them both on Amazon US and Amazon Canada for way less than 100 but I have not seen them on Amazon.co.uk. We were going to save this for the end of the review, but since we're talking about cost right now, starting now and running the entire month of January, you can get an additional 10% off if you purchase anything, not just these puzzles, this direct from Escape Welt. And yes, this stacks with dis the discounts Mo mentioned. The code is BELLHOP, all one word. I hope you know how to spell that one. Now, the goal of these puzzle boxes is to get them open and figure out what's inside. Now, what I think is even neater is that once you solve the puzzles, you have a very cool gift box that you can then put something even cooler inside and give the box to someone else, who will then have to solve the box on their own to get to this new and improved prize. For a look at exactly what you get with these puzzles, check out our Escape Wealth unboxing videos on YouTube. We've got a separate video for each box. Already live now. In addition to the wooden puzzle boxes themselves, you also get a card signed by the person who assembled the box and a small multi-language booklet with a fictional story about where the box came from. What you won't find are instructions or a rule book or anything telling you exactly what to do next, where to start or how to solve these puzzles, nor any form of a solution. Just figuring out where to start is a challenge in and of itself. Yes. Now, both boxes I received were very solid, really well made, beautifully made, uh, laser cut, but also laser etched with artwork and stuff on them. Uh, well assembled, assembled and extremely engaging. Um, they featured multiple different bits that you can twist, turn, push, pull, slide, spin, open, and so on. Now, as you can see in the unboxing videos, it's hard not to start playing around with these puzzle boxes mm -hmm. from the moment you get them in your hands. Oh, seriously, like you get one of these in your hands and you can't help it. You're going to fiddle with them. Um, they, they, you just want to try to figure this out. Now, one thing that is important to note with these puzzles is that you don't want to force anything. These are all assembled in a way that things that should slide, slide, and things that shouldn't move, don't move. Now, they are made from birch. Birch is not the strongest wood. Just think of what any usual laser cut puzzle is made out of. Um, while the birch is strong, it's not meant to be solved by force. You shouldn't have to bend anything or twist anything too far. Like when you got a knob, don't yank on it. Just give it a little tug. They are only laser cut wood. Yes, you can break them open. Yep. That sort of defeats the point and renders them useless, even as pretty objects. True enough. Now, now to, get in, oh, oh. to get inside each box, you're going to have to go through multiple steps all of which can be figured out through logic and deduction. Now, you can brute force some of the puzzles. And by brute force, I don't mean strength. I mean trying every possible combination until you get the one that works. And you may be able to solve aspects of the puzzle through kind of metagaming it by looking at, like, when I pull this, this jiggles, um, which is one way to get through. But, like, there is a logical solution to each part that doesn't require you to be a safe cracker. All right. Well, now that we know what you get with one of these escape well bo puzzle boxes, how about you share your thoughts on each of them? We're going to start with House of the Dragon. All this right. Sounds good. This escape box has an Asian theme of a pagoda with various dragons on it. There are a set of doors on one side, which you're trying to open by figuring out a multi-step puzzle. Now, as noted already, there's really nothing here to indicate where to start. And we found ourselves poking and prodding and trying to pull and twist various things for at least a good 15, 20 minutes before we even figured out how to do anything with this box, which was surprisingly quite fun, even not getting anywhere. Watching you try not to play with it and get lost in its functions during the unboxing yep. was very amusing. 
yeah i gotta say it was hard both unboxing videos you can see it i don't want to put them down like you get these in your hands you just want to fiddle with it uh this first box i i honestly i fiddled around with it for a bit didn't get anywhere very quick and i kind of put it down on my shelf and then deanna would come in the room and she'd pick it up and fiddle with it and then you know it'd sit somewhere in our house and then someone else would pick it up and fiddle with it and be like did you get any further did you figure anything out and i'd be like oh wait well i figured out these pull out but this one doesn't that's got to mean something and this kind of went on for an entire day. Now, the next day, my kids got involved. Once my kids got involved, it became more of a mission to get this completed. They were they were on a mission. They were they wanted to solve it. So we kind of sat in the front room with all the Christmas decorations and all the other Christmas stuff around. And, and we're sitting there and and we we literally sat there and tried to figure it out. And I got to give props to Gwen for figuring out the next step once Deanna and I got stuck. And then once we figured out that step, we kept fiddling, and then we figured out even more. And then it took probably a good part of the afternoon when we finally did solve the puzzle, get to open it up and see our prize. So total time guesstimate, maybe? <laughs> uh, so now the website, I've seen various. It looks like, like depending on if you're looking at their product page or their homepage or the Kickstarter, seems to last times between an hour to two hours. Um, I would say it took us more like three, possibly even four, but like, we didn't just sit down and do it. Like we didn't sit and play with this till we solved it. So I can't really give you one. It was more of a pick it up and play with it for a bit, put it down. You know, you're sitting there waiting for something to happen and you're playing with it or we're handing it back and forth. Now, the thing is, and this, I think the biggest reason why it took us so long, this isn't our jam. This is not the type of puzzles we do. I, I'm good with pencil puzzles. Deanna's good at logic puzzles. Dee loves solving mysteries and put parts together. Fiddling with a piece of wood where you have to manipulate things in different ways is not really something we're familiar with. And I have a feeling things would just go much quicker for someone who's used to doing escape boxes or those puzzles where you have to fit different pieces together or take them apart or, you know, here's a bunch of weird pieces, build an elephant. I just think people would be better at that. Now, I do know for us, the second box went quicker because we just had a better idea of what kind of things to look for, what the end goal was, and the kind of things that can and can't be manipulated on them. Yeah, I, I think these are a lot like crossword puzzles, right? The first time you sit down at a crossword puzzle, you really don't have any idea other than if you happen to know the clue. Whereas the more crossword puzzles you do, the more mm -hmm. you learn the ins and outs yes. of that style of game, the tricks and, the, and mm -hmm. the, the things that happen and get used a lot. Now, another part of this puzzle taking so long, though, is there's a part of this we were completely stuck on that we ended up having to brute force, where there was um, we had to figure out a configuration of some buttons. And my daughter solved it basically through trial and error and noticing things jiggled, right? She's like, when I pull this, these buttons move and these don't. That must mean something. And we did end up having f figuring out that part of the puzzle, which is was fairly early on. And I ended up looking up online going, okay, we know what buttons we have to put where to open this, but why? Why would we, how would we have figured this out without brute forcing it? And unfortunately, there's an issue with this box, an actual literal typo on the laser cut wood that's etched in there. And this is in regards to one of many Japanese words that are on the box. One of them is spelled wrong and has an extra letter in it. Now, you shouldn't need to know Japanese to solve this box. That's not a requirement to solve the puzzle, nor should you even have to Google Japanese words. Like, that's this is not like some of the other escape room games we played recently. This does not require any external information if it's done right. If everything was spelled right, you just have to match up stuff that's on the box. But you can't do that because they don't match because of the spelling error. Now, if you happen to know Japanese, you're probably really going to quick catch this error. You're going to see it and be like, oh, well, the rest of the words on this page are spelled right. That's obviously meant to be this word, but none of us know Japanese. And I got to say, this was frustrating. And at the price point, this costs inexcusable. Yeah, this is really frustrating. Now, I actually can count to 10 in Japanese, but that's only because me and my kids took karate and a lot of dojos these days aren't even teaching counting to 10 in Japanese. Way now, to spoil it, Sean. A lot of, what? <laughs> what, I can count to 10 in Japanese. But you're giving away that you need to look for numbers. I didn't say that. 
You did. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> I think that 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 I that seems like a big hint to me. I didn't see that in the notes ahead of time. The only thing I can do is count to ten in Japanese. It's the only Japanese I know. Fair enough. Yeah, that's not needed at all for this puzzle. <laughs> uh, but uh, I mean, it's you're talking about numbers and knobs and things. But uh, the other problem you run into in this game that I, that we didn't really address is the font they used. Oh the yeah, the font. It's... They went with a a cursive Japanese esque font which there may or may not be issues with that that i won't go into because i'm not of uh i'm not asian but the font has some interesting characters um the i looks like a j uh for instance we thought it was a t t for a long time yeah and it's it's a very questionable font choice that even if the spelling is correct has its own problems involved yeah now again, that shouldn't matter. It should be an issue of matching things. So as long as you have whatever that squiggly letter is in the <laughs> same place in two spots, you should be able to solve it, even if you can't read what it's saying. Now my other disappointment with this particular escape room box was the the prize, um, which I'm not going to spoil, other than to say don't expect much. Um, didn't feel like much of a reward when getting the box open, is all we'll say. Now, what I did like is the fact that once you knew the solution, it was extremely easy to put everything back together and solve it again uh, within minutes, possibly even seconds. I never timed myself, but I have a feeling if you put that puzzle in front of me, I could probably get it open in under a minute at this point. It's surprising how quick you can actually solve these once you know how to solve it. Yeah, as you suggested earlier, familiarity with this type of puzzle goes a long way to solving it more quickly. So overall, House of the Dragon was the better looking of the two boxes that I got. Uh, It's the one I think I would most like to re-gift because it'd be the neater, oh, what is this cool thing I just got? But the fact it's got an error on it that makes the puzzle unsolvable by using problem solving unless you happen to know Japanese means I don't want to pass this frustration we had to anyone else. Yeah. So a label over top of the etching would really ruin the nice look of the box oh plus give away something pretty clear i think if, <laughs> if, if you knew exactly where the spelling error was and it didn't give anything away i would just tell you what the problem is right now okay so what about the fort knox box all right let's start with the important thing there's no errors on this one not that that made it any easier to solve or any quicker uh this one looks like a hexagonal vault like an actual safe that you're trying to crack which i gotta say is pretty cool um deanna mentioned it well she were to say this one was just more intuitive and had more logical starting points because it seemed like a puzzle i get that and i'm like oh, i don't know it's this weird pagoda thing with things on it this was like oh there's dials and there's things and numbers that alone made it more enjoyable for her to play with because it had logical things to do right away there are way more levers and dials on this box compared to house of the dragon more things you can actually fiddle with and it just looks and feels more like a puzzle waiting to be opened yeah even just straight out of the box it looked like a puzzle while House of the Dragon looked more like a decoration that had some puzzle secrets. Yes. Now, I'll admit, I'd rather have House of the Dragon on my shelf than I'd rather have the other one, because it does look kind of cool. Now, similar to House of the Dragon, there was one part of this puzzle that everyone but me managed to solve by luck rather than logic. Uh, this was a particular dial thing. That one, I actually happened to catch the the correlation and did the way the puzzle wanted you to instead of just fiddling around. But unlike House of the Dragon, it was clear where to find the answer if you spotted it. So you're like, oh, well, why does it do this? And you're like, oh, because I should have got this hint here and I missed it. That's fine. Now, there was also one puzzle here that was not at all intuitive. And everyone in my family who managed to solve the puzzle, which the kids worked together, I solved it on my own, then Deanna later solved it on her own, um, end up having to brute force it. But it wasn't quite brute force. It was more deduction but we didn't do it the way the game intended. And even that one, though, I looked up online, I went online, and I'm like, okay, that makes sense. I I can see it. I wonder how many people who got this puzzle did it that way without just instead using process of elimination. Again, I don't want to spoil anything, but it was nice to know that there was a logical answer for everything. And again, this is only your second one, and these are not the same sort of mental puzzles 
that you guys are used to with the other escape room games that you've been playing up until now. Yeah. And as Deanna just mentioned in the chat, logical process of elimination is still solving it. That's why I said it wasn't brute force. We didn't try every possibility. We're like, it's one of these. And, but there was a way to figure out what it was. Now, why one complaint about this puzzle is a physical aspect. There is a specific part of this puzzle that you have to pull out that is very tight. Since we're trying to all be careful and not break anything, again, this is birch. It's not a super strong wood. None of us were willing to apply enough force to get this piece out. I ended up watching a YouTube video because I was stuck and then saw the person go, well, you pull this out. And I'm like, oh, that's meant to come out. And even seeing it, I grabbed it and I'm like, okay, there it goes. Like, it really feels like it shouldn't come out. And there is no way anyone in my family would have pulled that piece out without knowing about it. So here is a very minor, almost spoiler. On the bottom, there are two things that look like you should pull on them. One is meant to come out right from the start. Nothing has to be done to pull that out. The other will come out, but only when you've done other parts of the puzzle. So give them both a yank. And actually, if you hand me, where are they? Oh, it is far away. I can't <laughs> quite hold it. I'm like, I'll show you. I will show you the one that comes out. Because I don't think this is spoiling anything. Okay, yeah. look, I'm, I, this isn't going to spoil anything. Because it's very obvious there are two things there to be yanked on. This big fat one comes out. There. <laughs> that well, now comes out much easier than it used to. Right. So yeah, there's a couple of things. I, I you know, depending on uh, if you saw this or not, these are three mil birch um, at most, maybe even two mil. Uh, you could, you know, a strong man, a strong person could probably crush most of the parts of this in their hand. It would hurt them, but you could really damage this puzzle. So it's understandable that, uh, you're, you're being a little hesitant to try and yank yeah. on this stuff. Um, oh, exactly. Now, one thing I would honestly recommend, especially early on when you're first learning these for any of these sorts of puzzles, it's worthwhile to have a buddy who's not doing the puzzle who can check online for you. Let them spoil the surprises by watching a video and only, and then they're able to give you the bare minimum information mm -hmm. to get you over something like, oh yeah, no, that that's supposed to move. Yeah. Yeah. You go ahead, pull that. Yeah. Um, you know, little stuff like that, um, is, is a really helpful tool, uh, in your quiver until you're used to how these sort of puzzles are built. Yep. Yeah, and honestly, that's basically what we did, is this one I solved on my own because we had another purpose for it, which I'll get to in a bit. So, except for the minor quibble that that one piece really, when we first got it, did not feel like it was supposed to come out, uh, this box was fun to play around with and got solved much quicker than the other box. Um, the actual puzzle just felt more logical, like the steps made sense. And it felt like every time someone picked it up, they figured out something new, like another step. It wasn't like, no, I don't know. I still have no clue. It was more of a, oh, wait, there's this here. That might matter. And, oh, wait, I think these are tied together and so on. Overall, a more rewarding experience than House of the Dragon. Though, again, the prize at the end, uh, I don't know what else they could have put in there, but come on. You know, I expect most people who buy these find the success of beating it the only real reward and yeah. probably tend to expect something a little cheesy inside. Even cheesy might have been better. I, I, it's up to you to discover it. Even better, make sure someone gives it to you and puts something actually cool in there. Overall, Fort Knox box was the better of the two escape world puzzles we tried. Not just because it didn't have any mistakes on it. Um, you could instantly tell it was a puzzle to be solved. You get it and you're like, oh, it's a puzzle, not, oh, this is a cool thing to put on my shelf. Um, it, it, there was a pretty clear indication on where to start and the eventual solution just made sense once you started putting things together. Um, this one, we actually ended up reusing on Christmas morning. So I planned it this way. I opened it up after the kids were obsessed on the first one going, did you put something inside? And I'm like, no, I haven't opened it. I don't know what's inside it. Yeah, well, after having them asked on the first one, I opened this one up myself. I did the research myself, and I spoiled parts of it myself. And then I slipped in a piece of paper that let the kids know they had a new Switch game already installed on their Switch, closed up everything again, and put it under the tree. Now, while the kids were frustrated at first and honestly begged me to tell them what their gift was, by the end of the day, with a little bit of prodding here and there, like, yes, 
yeah, Gwen, you're pulling on that. That is supposed to come out. Go ahead, pull harder. Just as Sean said, they had managed to figure it out and were happily playing wobble dogs. <laughs> well, there we go. So again, it's one of those things where the what you get out of the puzzle can really depend. Some people, mm -hmm. it may just be the fact that, hey, I got it open. Awesome for me. While others might want a little extra something inside. Now, looking at both these puzzles together, I'm mostly impressed. I honestly wasn't sure what to expect when I signed up to check out what Escape World stuff. And I got to say, overall, I had more fun than I expected with both of these boxes. It was just shocking how engaging they are, how much fun they are just to fiddle with. And I had both of these sitting on my desk for a couple of days, and I was constantly picking them up and fiddling with them and trying new things and trying to figure out why things were, were, were twisted or why can I push these in and why doesn't this one move? There's got to be a reason. Now, of course, the joy was marred by the fact House of the Dragon had an error on it that made it pretty much impossible to solve logically. Yes, we got through it. We got it open. We felt good, but we knew we brute forced it. We knew we got these this configuration by luck more than by actual thing. And that bothered me. So overall, I'm kind of on the fence. Like on one hand, we had a lot of fun. I actually want to try some of their other puzzles. They got an Egyptian themed one with a pyramid that looks really cool. But then if that has a printing error, I don't want to go through that again. I don't want to get frustrated and stuck to look online only to find out what's not my fault. And I'm not dumb. I just, you know, it, it had a mistake. Uh, what I do know is if I was going to go buy something on Escape, well, I would make sure to check a few reviews like this one to make sure I wouldn't be buying what's a basically a defective puzzle. Indeed. And we happen to know for a fact that uh, the one we got has less mistakes than yes. other people have gotten. So they are improving, but not fully. Um, yes. It's, it's frustrating because the fact is, this is laser cut. They are putting this into a machine and, you know, hitting play on a program to laser cut this. It's not yes. like they have to hand write it every time. Mm -hmm. So how they're sending this out with these errors is, is kind of shocking. Yeah. So the video I watched actually had two errors on their box. Now, I do know this was Kickstarted, so I don't know if that's a difference between the Kickstarter or the retail, but I will say that the, mine was produced recently and shipped recently. So anyone who's purchasing it at this point should not have that second error, which we didn't even mention, which was a reversed letter. Now, my other big concern, of course, here is the price. Yes, they're nice. They're solid boxes. And Sean said you can crush them. You need a lot of strength. Like they're they're double reinforced. They're not while each piece of wood is flimsy, the way they are constructed, I think makes them very structurally sound. I was extremely impressed by the engineering work done on these. There was some really neat mechanics at work here that did some cool things. But I don't think the full price listed on a Cape Welts website is really justified. Now I will note. Again, I've never seen them charge that full price. These seem to be one of those games that are always on sale, like a certain other game we're not going to mention here. I really feel that the price listed is never charged and that they have a perma sale going. And they're trying to do the marketing of, oh, look how much I'll save if I buy this. I'm going to get it half off. And I got to say, I'm not a fan of that type of marketing. It just bothers me that it seems like they're doing this. Yeah, I mean, it's manufacturer's suggested retail price. Yeah. Uh, and they are clearly aren't enforcing a, a map on any retailers. So it's frustrating, but it's hard to say they're doing anything specifically wrong. No, no, it's not wrong. Just like Tim Horton saying, go buy our breakfast sandwiches now for $6, and it ends up that's a dollar more than yesterday. Uh, marketers will market. Uh so usually we finish off our reviews by talking about who um, should pick these up, right? What, and, and, and who should buy this? And I'm not sh sure. Um, this is a tough one. Like, I am really glad I got to check them out. I think they're cool. They were awesome. They were a lot of fun. It was awesome on Christmas Day. The, my girls sitting there trying to figure out what would fit inside this box because they're a certain size. And then realizing, oh, you know what? Switch games are small. There might be a video game in there. We've got to solve this. Was pretty awesome. But I didn't have to pay for these. 
Um, while we are not paid for this, this is not a sponsored post. We did receive review copies, um, comp review copies of these. They were gifts from uh, Escape Well. That high price point, inflated or not, is a big turnoff here, especially if they ever do charge that full price. Yeah, well, I think that people who like this kind of fizz, fizzly puzzle may, in fact, be drawn to these. And if yep. you've got someone who likes painting, this sort of thing uh, could could be fun as well. I think the uh, the pagoda would look fantastic painted as a mm -hmm. decoration. Um, they just have also happen to have some puzzles that need to be solved as well. Yeah, uh, I admit, like these would look great on my game shelves. Well, if you really love puzzles and you've got the money to spare, you will probably have fun with these boxes. They aren't easy, and there's lots of really cool engineer going on here. Yeah, I think my dad back in the day would have loved these. Like, I, I, he had a, a Chinese puzzle box back in the day, which he loved. Now, I do say out of the two of these, I reckon I, uh, recommend the Fort Knox box of the two. But I could see getting the House of the Dragon because they have a number of different bundle deals that include multiple different puzzles. And if, you know, it works out, you're getting the dragon for free there. That'll excuse that small printing error, especially now that you know it's there. Yeah. So when buying for yourself, consider their long term purpose. What are you going to do with it when you've solved the puzzle? And mm -hmm. this is what may help you decide one way or another. Yeah, these look great. Like, they're right behind me on the Calyx there. I'm, I'm going the wrong way. Or sorry, they're not on the Calyx. They're just behind me. They just look cool. They're, they're neat looking. I think these would look good on, on my game shelves downstairs. But even more so, like, in our house, the way we have it set up, we don't have a coffee table. But, like, if you've got that coffee table in front of your couch and your friends come over and you're going to sit down, they're going to pick this thing up and be obsessed with it and totally miss whatever game happens to be on TV or whatever you're watching because they'll be fiddling with these puzzle boxes. I think it makes a good knickknack or tchotchke to keep at the end. Yeah, absolutely. Now, where I think these really shine, though, honestly, is picking them up as a gift for someone else, especially when you open them up and put another small gift inside, even if that's just a note for a bigger gift, as we did. Um, these make awesome gift boxes that require some work on the part of the recipient, which honestly is going to make getting that final prize, the final gift, even more rewarding than just ripping off some wrapping paper. This way, you also get double the fun, right? You're going to get to solve the puzzle yourself and then have the joy of watching someone else try to solve it. Certainly easier than wrapping a box inside of a box, inside of a box, inside of a box. This way, you get to only wrap one box, but still have some fun with it. There you go. Well, that's it for our look at two different escape boxes from Escape Welt. Do you dig physical puzzles like these? Do you have a recommendation of a puzzle box we should consider checking out? Let us know in the comments. Uh, before I go, I just want to invite you to check out my written review of these escape room style boxes over at the blog, tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. Uh, so with Christmas hitting just a couple days ago, uh, there hasn't been a lot of time for gaming. Now, I did get two new games and an expansion, which included Drop It, Monstrosity, and the Alchemist expansion for Quats Quedlinburg, as well as a little promo for Reef. Um, I haven't gotten a chance to play them, obviously, but I did get the unboxings recorded, all of them. So that part is done, so they're ready to play as early as tomorrow. I actually did get some in-person gaming done that wasn't with my kids or Mo, and that <laughs> was with my sister and her husband's family, who invited me over to their place for Christmas dinner. And my sister had been telling them about a game that she had played as a kid that she liked. Spellmaker, which we talked about recently. <laughs> well, I happened to have our old family copy of it and brought it along for a couple of games after Christmas dinner. As well, they happen to be fans of Kark and Catan, so I may have another gaming group in town that I get to play with. There you go. That's kind of awesome. You're going to have to start borrowing games to expand their horizons. Yeah. Have you guys heard of Pulsar 2845? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So how did it play? Because I know you hadn't really gotten to replay Spellmaker and you'd had some comments about um, following what it would designers suggested variants or something yeah. like that, wasn't there? Yeah. So while I can uh, objectively, as you know, someone who's been involved in this show for 195 episodes, 
stand back and identify the problems with the game's mechanics today. Um, and we did use the designer's suggestions, and I have to say, they did absolutely improve it. Nice. However, it is still a 44-year-old board game. <laughs> okay. now, that, now, that being said, with a group of casual gamers, it can be a lot of fun, and it's far, far better than your average 70s rolling move. So is this one worth bringing over? We can do a full review of a classic 13th floor. We'll go back to the 70s. and uh, Absolutely. It's, it is All a four-player, right. though. We can't do five, so can, we got we to gotta keep that in mind. All right, so maybe, maybe not a Friday night game, but some other time. <laughs> So besides the Christmas games that I unboxed, um, I also unboxed a ton of other stuff this week. So while I didn't get to play games, I cracked open a ton of stuff. There is shrink wrap all over this room, just below camera level. You have to wade through it to get in the room right now. This includes three new Valeria games, expansions for two of those, Dolce, Marvel Champions, the puzzle boxes we reviewed tonight I had to open up, and the massive Hunter Killer Agatha Christie, the mystery at Hunter's Lodge, which was super impressive looking. And I'm probably forgetting at least two more. Now, if you miss those events on Twitch, keep an eye on YouTube for when all those unboxings go live. We had two go live just today. Yeah, just today. We're probably going to have a little bit more than one a week to get kind of caught up on unboxings in a way here. Uh, the next big one to go live, and I'm, here's another one I forgot in the list, Weather Machine. Weather Machine is actually probably going to go live next Monday, if not sooner. We're going to get that one up because I know everyone's all excited about Weather Machine. Everyone wants to play it, and man, does it look good. And you get to see it with the deluxe components and the non-deluxe components because I love this. Um, the publisher, Eagle Griffin, kept in the old stuff. So you get to see both, which is really cool. So you'll get to see what comes in the retail version as well as the, the, the upgrade or Kickstarter or whatever other versions are out there. I'm not sure what's out in retail. So that one's on there. Man, it looks good. Like, like some of the best components I've seen in a Euro game. And that's the big thing is this is not a, you know um what would steam forged you know this is this is this is eagle griffin putting this game out now jumping back to the mystery of hunter's lodge so that is the one game that i did get to play in the last week um this was brenda deanna's mom is a huge agatha christie fan um deanna is also a fan of the series um we found out in the last year that that brenda is a huge murder mystery fan game fan sorry murder mystery game fan it's already been like reading murder mysteries mysteries and and solving crimes while well, she's gotten rather impressed by the games we've been bringing over various escape room games but what she likes more was the style like the maple brook case she likes the here's all your evidence here's all your stuff you need to read and piece together and logic out so our big plans for christmas eve this year were to attempt to at least start on, if not solve, the mystery of Hunter's Lodge. And let me tell you, having seen this box of stuff during the unboxing, I was super excited to hear about how this went after oh, the night. It is so, I, I almost wish we'd live stream that. Not that Brenda and my kids wanted to be on live stream, but I like the, the, the component quality here is, is off the wall. Like, I cannot talk about any board game that has components as impressive. It's it's in a different category of game. It's a different style of game. You you have heirlooms here that you're going to keep for the rest of your life after playing this game. And honestly, this just started off with Brenda checking out what came in the box. Like we were, it was getting kind of late. My mom was there. She's not as as much into the games, and we weren't sure what we were going to do. But like before we go, you got to check this out. And and Brenda just like slowly going through every bid as I did in the unboxing video. Uh, which isn't live yet. Sorry, I can't send you to it yet. It'll be up soon enough. Again, there's too many to get out right now. And and just, it, it like, this is a literal wooden chest, like a full-size wooden chest. I'd show it to you, but it's still at Brenda's, um, with a locked drawer in the bottom. And there's all kinds of stuff in there. there there's papers, documents, uh, sealed envelopes, a sealed manila envelope, an actual signet ring, a family crest, like a banner you put on the wall, a drinking flask, and more. This is literally the most impressive physical components I've seen in anything called a game before. Yeah, it, it's really hard in audio to get across just how gorgeous yeah. this product is. And to be fair, it is not cheap either. No. Even the non-deluxe version is $100 for a one-and-done mystery. Yeah. So again, you get to keep all the stuff. This is... 
Agatha Christie, um, The it's Mystery hard. of Hunter's Lodge by Hunter Killer. Hunter Killer is the company that publishes it. And we happen to have the collector's edition, which comes in the the giant wooden box, which, like I said, I'd love to show it off, but... Um, the suggested playtime is four hours on it. It and it's just it's so impressive. And like I know one of the items that's in the drawer is is a wristwatch because they spoil that right on Hunter Killer's website. Um, this is our first time working with Hunter Killer. So I gotta say, like, like here's Brenda taking this stuff out, and like I'm expecting the stuff to go back in the box, but it's not getting there. And then like Deanna's grabbing sheets of paper to read, and I grab the instructions and start flipping through it. And sure enough, we start trying to solve the mystery. Like we just couldn't help it. Um, it was just so much stuff. Like, like it, we were picking up notes and letters and journals, and we were all in. While it wasn't actually planned. As it was already a bit late, the entire family got involved. Even my mom, who was like, you know, trying to sit off to the side, was like yelling out suggestions on things we could do. Like we, we ended up diving into this pretty big. Yeah, and there's so much to explore and read with everything being a potential hint. Uh, even paying attention to the styles of handwriting can yes. be important. Oh yeah. And there was stuff like stuff. There 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 were police records. There was a, a military um transcript. Like they the, the amount of different pieces of paper. And this was fantastic for a couple of hours at least. Like I asked Deanna and she doesn't even remember. It was one of the we just lost track of time. Might have spent three hours with it. I don't know. We were with it for a long time. Um, trying to figure out who the suspects were and how they connected with each other. While we weren't able to eliminate any of the suspects, we definitely found multiple means and motives, which is the whole Agatha Christie thing, the three things you must have. And if you have those three things, you knew, know who did the murder. Uh, we were starting to find a couple of them. And Deanna and Brenda in particular were loving it. Gwen also, actually. And they all noted that they were having way more fun than they did with, say, Black Brim, which we reviewed uh, last week which is more of a puzzle game. It ends up the t three of them loved sifting through the clues, finding correlations rather than solving puzzles. It like more of a, Hey, this note goes with that bit and wait, this name, that name's mentioned. Do you think she's dating her? Were they seeing each other? Oh wait, they definitely were. Cause look at this other note that talks about seeing them together and so on. And I'm trying not to spoil anything. I don't think this does this is the kind of thing that happens in every crime investigation. I think. Uh, fair enough though. Like I personally, I am the other side of the spectrum. I like the puzzles. And honestly, the big thing I solved in the game was a, um, what do you call it? A crypto, you know, you get a cipher and you change the words. I, that was what I worked on. And that's where I felt proud of solving something, but it was very clear a, a cryptogram or whatever you want to call them where I had a bunch of stuff. So, and then my daughter, my youngest daughter also liked the, here's your puzzle work on it. More than here's just all this stuff. I don't know what to do with it, which honestly fits really well with her her learning disabilities and her sensory processing disorder. Too much stuff on the table is too much stuff for her to handle, which fits where she liked the individual bite sized pieces of black brim more. And honestly, that's a cool thing about these different escape room games and puzzle games is different bits appeal to different people. Whereas this box had a nice mix of both, though very much leaning towards the solve the murder side of things. Right. And indeed. And it's one reason why escape rooms should really be done in groups. Mm -hmm. uh, while there are exceptions, you generally don't want to do them solo um, or sometimes even two player to just enhance yeah. your odds of success. Now, the other thing I will note, this is an Agatha Christie murder. Yes, we let our kids play. But it's that solve a murder, two steps back kind of feel for people who are a little concerned about. There's no graphic depictions or anything like that in this game. So everything's going good until we started to get a little annoyed that we weren't able to open the locked drawer. Like you can tell, we kind of looked at everything here and we needed this three digit code. And we obviously need stuff from the three from the drawer to figure out what's next. So all of us focused on that. We're like, all right, let's all stop just passing things back and forth and making notes and like focus on trying to open this drawer. And we tried all kinds of various puzzles and solving and every three digit code that was on this, any scrap of paper was put into that lock and we just weren't getting it. It felt like we were missing something to the fact that literally felt like 
is there a piece of information we're missing? Are, are, are we, are we missing something? And we're talking about looking up a clue, which the clues are like many of these games available online. Well, before we looked up a clue, what I wanted to do is I wanted to double check. There's an inventory right at the start of the instruction book. And yes, I probably should have been checking that off as I unboxed everything, or I should have been doing that when we opened the box. But as I said, we weren't really planning to play. It just kind of happened Christmas Eve. So here I am going through the list going, yep, yep, got that, got that, got that, got that. Now, one of the things problems here is things aren't necessarily clear, like what you're looking for. So to, like journal, yes, okay, we have a journal. And that, you know, police records, that one's pretty clear. But then it's like, you know, random note. And you're like, well, what random note? Okay, so by process of elimination, we're left seeing that we are missing a nature guide. And sure enough, we're missing this component we we looked at everything we could uh, my review copy of the mystery of hunter's lodge collector's edition at its high price point and production value was missing a nature guide which is a multi-page pamphlet which i'm sure must contain what we needed next and it wasn't like you could just go to the hunter killer uh website and find these now mm -hmm. while they did have a transcription of the written text for accessibility purposes mm -hmm. without seeing the physical pages themselves, you still weren't getting all of the information nope. on those pages. The transcription would have helped if you couldn't read the handwriting, but that's about it. Yeah. Now, shockingly, this didn't really bother the rest of the family much. Uh, they were having so much fun with what they already had and were working on. They were happy to just keep playing, trying to make more connections and correlations, and not everyone had seen every document yet. Personally, I was more frustrated. I don't know. I, I, I was annoyed by this. Now, maybe because that same day I learned about the printing error on House of Dragon that we reviewed earlier, and I was already feeling skeptical of escape room style games. What is what's with this? What's with escape room puzzle style games and errors that make them unsolvable? Like going back to the shining from the op, the coded chronicles game, which I hear they've now fixed, but like at the time, or like like what is with that? Why does that keep happening? I, I'm just annoyed at this point. Like I, I'm almost tempted to like stop reviewing these because to me it is like I don't like being handed a puzzle I can't solve. Yeah, now this is an expensive mystery box and the internet is rife with spoilers, yes. but I was able to track down some people who'd solved it on a stream and actually posted the documents in PDF form on video as they did. Mm. I was able to screen cap the documents and forward them along, but yeah, you know what though, at that point it was late. Like, like this was, we, we started after 8 PM, right? It was late. Um, and I honestly, I don't want to use screenshots to solve a mystery. That's all about playing with this physical box. That's the whole point. The immersion of sifting through the documents that an actual detective might have in front of them. So I called it a night. Now I have since written hunt a killer, but haven't heard back from them other than them liking and retweeting my scathing tweet about them ruining Christmas Eve, which I thought was really weird um, that night that I sent, and I still feel justified in sending. Now I know it's the holidays, right? I'm not actually expecting a response right away, but I'm hoping I'll see something next week, at least after New Year's, and I'm hoping they're willing to, to do something to fix this. Now I do have to give props to an awesome Redditor who did send me an actual PDF that's the type where you could cut it out and make the document, which if nothing else, I'll use that to solve it. But I would, I want to know for reproof purposes, what's Hunter Killer going to do about this? Because what happens when the next person buys this box for 189 US and gets it and it's not complete? Yeah, indeed. Earlier in the episode, I mentioned my problems with rule books these days. Well, it seems if you don't have rule books, you need to find something else to mess up. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, the rule book was fine. Like, I, I guess my suggestion for anyone who gets this is before you even start. Well, you, you are starting, though, sifting through the stuff you're starting. Uh, check that index, like the, 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 the table of contents. And I got to say, and Deanna pointed this out, is it a bad sign that the first thing in the instruction book is check the contents? Like, is this a common quality assurance problem? I'll admit, this is our first time we've ever played or tried anything from Hunt to Killer. I hope this isn't a common thing. Yeah. Well, now on that note, how about a look ahead? What do you have <laughs> yeah. planned for the coming weeks? It's a two rant week for me this week. Only one. You got to be a patron to hear. All right. So 
uh, the plan for the coming weeks is to play games, play many, many games. It's been too long, two months without playing games, then all the holidays and everything going on with the holidays, talking about games, I'm unboxing games, but I want to play them, play them, I want to play them. So I've already got Monstrosity and Drop It queued up for New Year's Eve. That That is, we're definitely playing those New Year's Eve. I think my kids are going to love them. Our, our plans this year for New Year's is it's just the family. So looking forward to playing that. Um, I've got three new Valeria games I really want to get played. I want to dive back into Marvel Champions. I want to try more than just the starter decks and Rhino. Uh, Dolce looks really nice and quick, and honestly, at a level I think the kids will like, so that might also be a New Year's Eve game. Um, we still haven't done past Chapter 2 in Disney Sorcerer's Arena, so there's a two-player game Deanna and I might dive into. There's just so much, so many games, but it's a good thing. It's awesome. I, I want those games played in new to me games to be even higher for next year. So if I play all these before New Year's, we're going to have to re-record this entire episode and change the first half because it'll all be wrong because I'll have played so many new games in the last week of the year. Maybe we can make a note next year include last <laughs> week of December when looking at my 2023 games. There you go. Now, I do have to warn everyone, next Wednesday might be a longer-than-usual Bellhops tabletop, if not possibly a full episode of Holiday Gaming Based on Sean coming over and other things we're going to get done by the end of the year. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. Donna, thank you to our local paladin. Valentine Pache, thank you. Mechanical Muse, I hope you had a great holiday. Ron F, keep talking tabletop there, Ron. Roger Malosh, who we now need to sit down with, and I don't even know if Sean knows this, I think he mentioned it last week, to teach and play Eclipse Second Dawn for the Galaxy. Totally up for that. I am totally up for that. We, I need to play that with more players. The pandemic means I've only played my copy with three players. Thank you, Roger. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at TabletopBellhop.com, all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice. If you dig what we've been doing, it would be awesome if you stopped by Patreon.com slash Tabletop Bellhop and tipped your bellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us. You're welcome to stick around for our penthouse suite after show. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.